Welcome to Book Talk. Imagine British forces being sent to war on the basis of diplomatic agreements that were reached by senior ministers, but which weren't debated by the Cabinet for years and were never really debated by Parliament at all. Not Iraq 2003, but France and Belgium in 1914, when what the Kaiser dismissed as Britain's contemptible little army was sent to the Western Front at the outbreak of the First World War. It was on the basis of agreements that were reached behind the scenes via diplomatic back channels, and they had incalculable consequences for world history. That story is told by my guest today, the former Foreign Secretary David Owen, in his new book, Hidden Perspective. And David Owen, Hidden Perspective in, in this case means the Foreign Office, at the start of things at least, developing enthusiasm for abandoning Britain's traditional foreign policy of splendid isolation, sort of balancing the balance of power, and joining a system of European alliances which ultimately fought the First World War between them. Yes, there's no doubt. The majority of the senior diplomats when uh, Gray took office were in favor of moving from the Entente Cordiale to a disguised military alliance, aligning ourselves with the French. The French were pushing very hard for the British to commit themselves, this is in 1906, to a British expeditionary force if France was attacked by Germany. And Edward Gray, after some initial hesitation, lined himself up with this policy and from 1906 to 1911, December 1911, it never went near the cabinet. This is an extraordinary tale in a way because this is a the, the almost literally earth-shaking policy change that happened completely below the radar that was implemented in discussions between two sets of military officers and how to get a British force into France and no one told the Prime Minister. At least the first Liberal Prime Minister, Campbell Bannerman, who came in in, in 1906 was aware of that. He didn't last very long and his successor didn't find out about it for years. No, it is extraordinary. Gray, who is a close friend of uh, Asquith, who became Prime Minister after Campbell Bannerman, it's pretty clear, did not tell him until April 1911. So for three years, Asquith was unaware of what are called the military conversations. And funnily enough, my research shows pretty clearly that Gray wanted to go to Parliament. And we have a wonderful uh, private telegram from his private secretary talking about these miserable creatures, which was also his boss, and, if you like, setting up our ambassador in Paris to go and write to Gray and say, the world will come to an end, more or less. France will go up in uproar if we reject this. You have got no way of keeping the Entente Cordiale together unless you accept this proposal. And so it was a... Uh, the private secretary meant to have total loyalty to the foreign secretary conniving behind his back that this should be done. Also, you have, on contrast, the uh, permanent secretary, rather wise uh, old diplomat, Lord Sanderson, telling the French what you're asking the foreign secretary to commit to, if it became public, would be a cause for impeachment, because he would be committing himself to coming to war without telling Parliament. And we Shades of 2003 in the Iraq war. It does seem absolutely extraordinary. It's a yes ministerish, but with a horribly serious end to the story. And yes, I think it, there is a serious import. I, I go on to discuss, of course, what happened when they had two cabinet meetings under Asquith's chairmanship in 1911. And he very skillfully came up with a new sort of guidelines. But the cabinet was against Gray by 15 to 5. I mean, it was a total disavowal, really, of what had gone before. The trouble was that Asquith couldn't bring himself to ask Gray to resign for many, many reasons. But one lovely vignette was Asquith was you know, involved with this whole question of um, Parliament reform and getting rid of the powers of the House of Lords. And a few months before this had been standing up for 30 minutes to cat calls from all the benches around, traitor, uh, squiffy, which was his nickname because he was a little partial to drink. And eventually uh, it fell to Gray, prompted by Margot Asquith in the gallery, uh, to stand up. She wrote, stand up to the cads. And he got up and he said very simply and very bravely and quietened the house, you know, if this man is not given a hearing, there will be none of us who will take his place. 
and it ended it. Now that's a loyalty that you have to repay and for that reason there was no question of Asquith demanding uh, Gray's resignation. My own view by then, Gray had become a liability in terms of getting a negotiation going with the Germans. And but you had this extraordinary situation where a foreign secretary had more or less secretly signed us into an, a military alliance with France, even if it was a defensive one, without really consulting the, the cabinet, let alone parliament. But it was uh, Campbell uh, Bannerman, funnily enough, who stopped him doing it. Campbell Bannerman suddenly realized he had these two people, Haldane, who was secretary for war, and Gray, who was foreign secretary, who were called imperialist liberals. They had supported the conservatives in the Boer, Boer War. And these two were going to come to a hostile cabinet with this proposal, and he suddenly realized they'd reject it. And he, but he, he quite wanted the thing to be done, and he then told Gray uh, it will not go to cabinet. So although Gray has taken the blame for that particular occasion, it was more Campbell Bannerman. And, you know, it's politics. Politics is a blood sport. He could see that within a month of forming a government, he was going to possibly lose his foreign secretary, which was not a... Very good it's start. Unfortunate, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but you still had this bizarre situation where you had, in effect, a secret alliance and the foreign secretary responsible for it didn't get the push and the whole thing was therefore kind of implicitly endorsed. Yes, and when in, we came to August uh, 1914, he made a speech in which the hidden perspective was revealed because for the first time he said, it's for the House to decide whether these are obligations, obligations of honour. It was, uh, by all reports, a uh, good speech. But it really was a terrible indictment over the foreign policy that had run before. By then, I don't honestly believe it was possible to change the policy. Certainly, you know, the Cabinet owned the British Expeditionary Force following the, the Cabinet discussion in 1911. The story goes on very much more interestingly to a direct involvement of negotiations with Germany in 1912 by Haldane. Of course, Gray should have gone. But you realize Gray never saying. went abroad at all. He went, he went to Paris in, with the king in uh, 1914. But up until then, he had not gone to any European country at all. Let's digress here for a second and talk about Edward Gray. I mean, you sat in the, the, that self-same office and looked out over the, 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 the view where the lights were going out over Europe in Gray's haunting phrase. How good a foreign secretary was he, do you think? Was, I mean, he, he was a very long-serving foreign secretary. He was in office for an awfully long time. Yes, from 1906 to 1916. By the end, I think Asquith was, wanted him to be moved. Um, uh, it's a difficult question. He's a very complicated man. He's a man who was a great hinterland. We were quite attracted to that in well, politics. All the fly fishing he and was so fly forth. fisher, wrote a very good book on fishing, uh, was a real tennis champion, uh, was a real countryman. Uh, he... He was a very complicated person. He had a very complicated marriage. He had then a very complicated uh, personal life. Uh, he did... On the real test of did this man do enough, if not to stop the war, to create a situation where we might have been able to use our naval power to bring the war to an end, I don't think he did anywhere near enough. I think he just keeps missing, and he's got this hidden perspective himself by then, that everything is set up against France. So when he has got virtually an agreement through Haldane, who was, after all, Secretary of State for War, with the German Chancellor and splitting Admiral Tirpitz away from the Chancellor. And all he has to agree to is really not a very meaningful sentence uh, about benign neutrality. And the Germans want neutrality, and Haldane has put in benign. And also, the Colonial Secretary, Harcourt, has come up with quite a good package to give Africa, some real chunks of Africa, to the Germans which they want. Now, if that mission had gone, the quid pro quo from the Germans was to reduce naval spending. So it has been a very substantive shift a in relations. out of an arms race, in effect. France wouldn't have liked it. And Gray, with the diplomats, conspired to ditch the agreement. And Gray's hidden perspective at this time was this great decision that Britain should stop its splendid isolation, should stop it sort of floating above European politics and making sure a balance maintained, and just come in on one side, be allied to France, be allied to Russia, uh, and therefore encircle Germany. 
That was one of the big problems. I have some sympathy with ending splendid isolation. Germany was becoming the main industrial power. There were a lot of signs that we couldn't go on with uh, splendid isolation. We needed allies. But the way we assembled allies in this particular way, through military arrangements, was dangerous. That did feed German encirclement. They got to hear of this almost within days. And then we enlarged it to involve Russia. And ironically, by 1913, there was very an great anxiety, both in London and in Berlin, about the rise of Russia and its forces. And that was feeding through another talks that took place privately in 1914, where Gray's private secretary, Tyrrell, was due to meet the foreign, German foreign secretary and could have taken place before the war started. But they, so he got married and they delayed the meetings. There was, Gray had no sense that it was all fragile out there. You know, I know nobody could have totally predicted what happened in Sarajevo, but there was a lot of fragile, very uh, well, dry that... tinder, and he didn't seem to grapple with it. You were saying that the First World War was perhaps a couple of years out, stoppable. Yes. I believe it was stoppable right up until the moment, really, that the Sarajevo shooting and then the, the reaction of the Austrians to it and the support they were given by Germany. I don't really think I would have eventually made any different decision in the Cabinet. It was a democratic debate that went on over that, uh, well, week, 10-day period. And um, I would have hoped I would have done a lot more to give the Navy an interventionist role to have been able to stop supplies reaching to Germany. It, it took us two years before we were really stopping supplies, mainly going through Holland. And the, the, you see, the war, the decision finally was the Germans breaking the treaty, which we had signed up to, and they had signed up to, to protect Belgium. They so invaded Belgium, France through Belgium. Belgium became the casus belli for the war probably on about the 2nd of August. Uh, it was that close. Now, a couple of points that come out of this for, for the modern day, really. Um, first of all, are there real parallels? I mean, you, you alluded to it earlier between Iraq in 2003 and what happened there in terms of secret diplomacy tying into agreements that were only revealed later on. Blair's uh, alleged to have said to Bush, I will, I'm with you to invade Iraq quite early on. Well, it will be interesting when Chuck, after all this length of delay, eventually gets out. I mean, they want to publish all the correspondence and the telephone calls that Tony Blair had with George Bush. It doesn't look as if the compromise will allow that, but I think we will get a pretty clear idea. And certainly it looks to me as if Sanderson were the permanent secretary of 1906 still alive, he would say this is an impeachable offence. Well, impeachment has largely gone off the uh, agenda. Actually, it still is possible to impeach somebody in the British Parliament, but I doubt that will be it. But I think the holding... Of course, there was a debate in Parliament, so Parliament was told. In many ways, the real problem was the Cabinet were not told. Now, I believe that, like in 1939, as in 1914, only the Cabinet could have decided. We have the Prime Minister's prerogative, but everybody understands. Prime Ministers don't declare war by themselves. They have to carry the Cabinet. And it's sometimes only that... I mean, if you look at the fluctuations right up until August the 4th inside that Cabinet, you need time. You need... It cannot take place in Parliament, that decision. But Tony Blair did go to Parliament. The real question is, did he tell the truth to Parliament? And that's, again, something which will presumably be at least in part answered by the Chilcot inquiry. And one very quick final thought. I mean, part of this story is the Foreign Office having its own policy and kind of enclosing ministers within it. Does that still go on, or is that oh, a yes. sort of Edwardian relic? Well, this private uh, letter, private correspondence, when I was uh, Foreign Secretary in 1977, I actually found a private letter which the... Uh, the diplomats had denied existed, and members of Parliament had been told by myself and others, as uh, Secretary of State, that it didn't exist. Private Eye had a copy. I then discovered that it did exist, and I stopped that private correspondence. I don't know whether it was... It. Now, of course, you can just ring up on your uh, iPads or an iPhone, so I suspect it's not such an important... But we're talking about government telegrams paid for by you and I as taxpayers, which were 
alleged not to be in the public domain, but of course they were, because we were paying for them. But the Foreign Office, do you think, does it still have its own mind, its own policies yes. and science ministers up to them on Europe, for example? Well, it depends. If the Foreign Secretary forms a loyal uh, private office, and doesn't need to bring in politicians from outside, he'll get them from young foreign diplomat, young diplomats from the Foreign Service, and he decides he's going to set policy, he can do it, and it, the powerhouse is the Foreign Secretary's private office. Some Foreign Secretaries just go along with the uh, consensus, and in that sense, Gray was a fairly passive uh, vehicle for the senior uh, diplomats. I won't say on everything, by any means, but broadly speaking, he agreed with them. And let's say he wasn't being told what to do, he actually did agree with them. It's a frightening perspective and one that will doubtless uh, come to haunt us as the Chilcock inquiry into Iraq is finally published. David Owen, thanks very much indeed for joining us on Book Talk. Okay.